welcome uh, and thank you all for being here on a late Friday afternoon. Uh, we all, I'm sure, are looking forward to the weekend and I appreciate your taking the time uh, to, to come together and talk about a very important uh, syndemic of COVID-19 and the opioid crisis. We see two very challenging um, crises, public health crises uh, amongst us now and the people that we have together today uh, to speak to you have devoted their work uh, to addressing the opioid crisis and are here to share uh, what they have learned and experienced, especially during this challenging time as the world and the United States grapple with addressing COVID-19. If you have any comments or questions, you can put those into the chat box and we have staff on standby to go through the questions and to share those with us when we get to that section of the presentation. We'll begin now, the impact of COVID-19 on the opioid crisis. Uh, I am Susan Michael Strasser. I'm the Senior Director for Human Resources for Health at ICAP at Columbia uh, University. And I am also a professor, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology here at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. Welcome. Today, I would like to give special thanks to Johnson & Johnson with whom we worked closely to develop the toolkit which I will present today and which was launched on October 31st through our website on International Overdose Awareness Day. I would also like to welcome people from Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal's office uh, in the State Assembly in Albany. Welcome and thank you for being here and recognizing the importance of this issue. I would like to recognize a number of people working very closely in the opioid crisis in the United States. First, I would like to introduce Angie Woody, former director of overdose prevention at the New York Harm Reduction Educators and Washington Heights Corner Project. We also have uh, Israel or Izzy Garcia, the naloxone coordinator from uh, the Washington Heights Corner Project and Sin Stern, a nurse leader at the Washington Heights Corner Project. We also have Dr. Denise Payon, Director of Research and Surveillance, the Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Prevention, Care and Treatment of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, as well as Dr. Sally Hodder, Associate Vice President and Director at the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute. I will give a more detailed introduction about each of them before their presentations. I would like to begin just talking about where we are today. And the Journal of the American Medical Association last week re, um, released a correspondence and two articles about the opioid epidemic during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is said that it is likely that the emergence of coronavirus disease or COVID-19 and subsequent disruptions in healthcare and social safety nets combined with social and economic stressors will fuel the opioid epidemic. Reports from national, state, and local media suggest that opioid-related overdoses are increasing. But the absence of real-time national reporting of overdose-related mortality limits the ability to confirm uh, these reports in mass. At the same time, we have seen substantial changes and some improvements in the way that services are being provided and um, some release of restrictions that were in place prior to COVID-19. There have been reduction in financial barriers to treatment and access to naloxone through the emergency expansion of Medicaid. There has been an easing of restrictions on the dispensing of methadone, uh, take home doses from 14 to 28 days instead of daily direct overdose dosing, and expanding the role of telemedicine in the care of patients with opioid use disorder. 
So today, as we discuss the syndemic, the two epidemics of opioid use disorder and the emergence of COVID-19, we will hear from some of the experts here in New York and throughout the country. I will begin by talking about a project that we completed uh, earlier this year with support and engagement of Johnson & Johnson. Many of you may know that Johnson & Johnson has been a long-standing supporter of frontline health workers, specifically nurses. As I was going through my training as a nurse many, many years ago, Johnson & Johnson was working then to elevate uh, the uh, importance of nursing in the world. And I think the uh, COVID-19 crisis has really shown the, the important and frontline role that nurses play. So we have been supported to develop something called ANCHOR, the Approaches for Nurse-Led Community-Wide Opioid Responses, to equip nurses and other frontline health workers with essential information, tools, and group facilitation techniques to activate nurses' unique frontline potential to, first of all, mobilize their communities to action, to create a comprehensive response to the opioid crisis and to derive, drive practical results-driven solutions at scale. And the emphasis there is on being practical and results-driven, which is something I think nurses historically are known for. Next slide. So the toolkit, I will give you just a brief overview of the toolkit, toolkit, which is freely available and downloadable from our website. It starts with an overall introduction to the purpose of the toolkit. It begins then with an understanding of today's reality with recent updates on the syndemic and the addition of COVID-19 amidst the opioid crisis. It talks about the origins and evolution of the U.S. opioid crisis, how over months, years, and decades, this crisis emerged to the, to the tipping point that we have seen in the last few years. It goes into the current situation, emerging issues in the crisis, but also promising practices in the response. As we were doing this work, we had the privilege to speak to people and travel to various parts of the United States prior to COVID and to speak with people at the front lines of work. And there are many people throughout the United States doing amazing things to address and improve access to care, to prevent uh, drug overdose, and to reduce drug overdose-related deaths. Often the good news doesn't hit the news cycle, but through our ability to travel and speak to people, amazing things are happening by people throughout the country to address this crisis. Taking action is the next part of the toolkit, promoting change through collaborative assessment, planning and action. And the emphasis there is on collaboration, working together as we see with the COVID crisis, working with communities, working together is essential to a comprehensive results-driven response. It takes all of us working together, trusting each other, being on the same page. And this is the ethos that we bring to this toolkit, controlling the crisis. And we build on what ICAF is known for, using data to drive interventions. And part of the challenge with the opioid crisis is having comprehensive national data to know where there are hot spots, to know where we are doing well. And so we are trying to put in frontline health workers' fingertips data that can drive performance improvement. And so we will share a method, a very practical method we have developed to measure progress towards a comprehensive local response. Next slide. So what we have developed is a dashboard to help people understand first, what is a comprehensive response? Many of us stay in our lane of work and we focus on a specific area of work, which is important to go deep into that special area of work. But it's also important to have a wide lens to understand what is the, the full complement of services that need to be available for people um, uh, tackling addiction, and drug use. 
And so we've tried to outline and define what are those key components of a comprehensive response, and they are listed here. They are stakeholder coordination. When we were able to travel around the country, we saw many people doing great things. But even in the same city, we often found that people had not connected to each other, knowing what each other are doing. So coming together, working together is essential to a robust response. Community engagement, working with leaders and, and people in the community, especially those that are most vulnerable. COVID-19 has taught us the absolute primacy of the social determinants of health. People are affected, their health is affected by all aspects of their life, not just their health care. And that has been brought home so clearly during COVID-19. So the toolkit tries to really um, put a priority on being in the community, being with people, know what is driving action, what is facilitating people getting care, and what is inhibiting people from getting care. Pain management, harm reduction, opioid use treatment, data use for decision making, training of health workers, training of frontline providers, training of anyone who may come into contact with people in crisis. Training, mental health training is so essential. And the news has shown us how, how um, critical, but how lacking many of our frontline responders um, are in their ability to respond to mental health crises. And then lastly, leadership development. Leaders are needed at all aspects of our health system and in our communities to drive change and to turn around the decades of risks that have brought about the opioid crisis in the United States. And I'll ask my colleague to bring up the website that goes through the stages that we have defined to address opioid use disorder. And if you can just scroll down to one of the um, colored arrows. And so what we have used is what is called a, cap a capability maturity model. We all begin by crawling and walking and we move to running. And so there are incremental steps that are taken in that progression. And so we've used that idea of a maturity model to map out each component of the opioid uh, response. And as you can see here, as we click through uh, each stage for each um, element, we have defined what that maturation looks like. So we begin with red. Red is a low indicator, so we are at stage one. We don't have responsiveness in that area. And it, it continues as, it, as the response matures up to a stage five where there is an integrated, sustained, robust response. So we have mapped out for each of these um, components, elements of stakeholder engagement, harm reduction, leadership. We have um, delineated what is the focus, what is the crux, what is the most important component of that response as you go from a, a, um, a novice response to an expert response, from stage one to stage five. And so this is a very simple but profound and helpful tool for people in communities to understand where they are and how their response is being driven. What components are missing? What components are, are incredibly strong? And what components do they need to develop? Next, uh, I think that is it for that presentation. You can go back to the slide deck, please. So I would like to pull up our first speaker and ask our speakers uh, from the New York Harm Reduction Center to um, put their mics on to go off of mute. And I will introduce them. First is Sin Stern. Sin has been working with syringe exchange programs nationally and internationally since their pre-legal days, including on the team of ACT UP volunteers with New York's harm reduction educators. Sin created Tricks of the Trade, a health and safety guide for street sex workers in 1991, 
that has been widely translated and remains widely used throughout the world. She first came to Washington Heights Corner Project as a registered nurse volunteer in 2011, but was quickly hired as health services coordinator. She currently splits her time between NYHRE's health clinic and the Washington Heights uh, Reduction Educators Program, Washington Heights Corner Project, excuse me, creating and providing essential staff and participant trainings and education materials. Israel or Izzy Garcia has been working with WHCP for seven years and is one of the youngest full-time staff members at both agencies. He started in his senior year of high school, which is awesome, as an intern under the Learn to Work program. In his spare time, he volunteered in the drop-in center and eventually landed a full-time position as the drop-in center manager. It's so important to have young people as part of this response. So thank you, Izzy. Izzy worked with young people who inject drugs and referred them to appropriate services when needed. Izzy is newly the naloxone coordinator for both projects. Angie Woody has volunteered and worked in harm reduction services for nine years in outreach, direct service provision, hepatitis C treatment, policy analysis, community organizing, and program management. After working on supervised injection facilities, research and advocacy, she came to WHCP and the New York Harm Reduction Educators as a director of overdose prevention, supporting a team of 60 authorized overdose trainers. Angie has taken on a new role as education and communication manager. Over to your team. Thank you. Can we have the next slide, please? That is us. All right, the next slide after that. So um, I should say very briefly that Corner Project is a community-based organization that was founded in November of 2005 by a social work student from Columbia. Um, we're merging with NIRI, uh, we're in the process of merging with New York Harm Reduction Educators, which is one of the originally wavered syringe exchanges in 1994 when the exchanges first became legal. Nairi was one of the first exchanges. So we've got new, new thought and older thought. Um, we, um, we started, actually I'm going out of order. So we're, we're working in a neighborhood that is terribly impacted by everything. Um, it was very badly hit by HIV. It is now very badly hit by overdose. We're, we're where we need to be. This is where the problems are. Can I have the next slide? Can I have the next slide? Oh, there we are. Uh, so when we started, we started, it was a single volunteer with a backpack providing syringes. Um, and we started adding other services as people or participants identified a need for them. Um, currently, we offer a pretty comprehensive array of services. Almost everything was driven by participant need, um, with the possible exception of has waste pickup, the outreach and public safety, which is cleaning the parks and um, playgrounds of schools from injection equipment. Um, next slide. Can I get the next slide? Angie, I think that's you. So, you know, as Sin was, as Sin was saying, um, we've really developed in response to the people who we serve. Um, so we've developed a really comprehensive um, array of services. And if you look across um, this, this tool, um, this dashboard, um, and look to see like, how developed we are in terms of stakeholder coordination. Um, harm reduction organizations nationally are really well networked um, and are constantly communicating to find out what people in other areas are doing and what could work for us at home. Um, we engage a lot with the community, going um, to police precinct meetings, going to community board meetings, uh, working with um, local schools, PTAs, et cetera. Um, we know who our community is um, and what issues they might have as they arise. Uh, pain management, 
Um, Harm reduction agencies historically haven't really been able um, to offer very much in terms of, of uh, pain management, but we're trying um, to increase that. And with our hub clinic um, opening in the last year, we have been able to offer that um, more comprehensively for folks, um, offering substance use treatment counseling and also providing it, um, offering low threshold uh, treatment with buprenorphine. So there we are offering um, opioid use disorder treatment, but we also offer holistic services, which really help for um, people to cope with pain, as well as many of the other um, of the other symptoms that come up and cravings themselves. Um, we are constantly assessing our program. Uh, Denise knows how much um, we have to report on to maintain our waivers. Um, and so we're constantly looking at how we're doing and what we can be doing better. Uh, we also offer a lot of training and really train up our staff. Um, so our peers are all certified um, under New York State AIDS Institute uh, peer certification. We work on training up our participants um, to be to future um, to, to help them in their future endeavors and also offer a lot of training to the community. I think we've trained um, over 7,000 people in naloxone over just the last year. Um, and in terms of leadership development, we do a lot of that in-house um, working. As you can see, uh, Izzy started out as a high school intern and you know now he's leading a really large team of authorized overdose trainers. So you know we're just really proud of how, um, how people develop um, in leadership roles in harm reduction. And that's so, yeah, I think, um, did we have anything else we wanted to cover? Yes, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, so, One more slide. Yeah, so um, why harm reduction? So we think that harm reduction works because um, right, if we don't, we don't want to tell anybody to like to just stop using or doing whatever they do cold turkey but exactly what harm reduction says, you reduce the harm and just by telling them maybe like, hey, just carry your Narcan with you or hey, uh, don't share your needle. We're just reducing that harm by that one little bit and they could continue and continue going on, you know? So um, we uh, it also provides them a safe space. We provide them with uh, information for them to learn safer practices. Um, yeah, and that's it. And then, um, Anything else you want to I'm super proud of our return rate for syringes. Part of that is the kiosk program, which took forever. Um, you know, I've been I've been in New York City for all of my life, and I'm 60. Um, and it took a long time to get that program started, but it's it's had an enormous impact in getting used injection equipment out of the parks. And I'm really proud of this rate of syringe return. It's, probably the highest to many of the syringe exchanges I've ever worked at or seen. But that might be it for us yeah. for now. I just want to say that we're so proud also of how many people our participants and our staff have saved, even just in the last year, that's 176 New Yorkers. So, um, you know, I can't say enough about that. That's, that's people who are alive today. Good point, Angie, thanks. Yep. Amazing. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Sin. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you, Angie. I was so touched when I saw that you had actually used that dashboard uh, <laughs> to, to evaluate your program. I'm like, all right, uh, something. Because you never know. You develop something and you're like, is it useful? So it was really heartening for me to see that. So thank you. And I want to say a special thank you to Izzy. I really like what you said, you know, just reducing harm that little bit. That's how you build a mountain, mm -hmm. little bit by little bit by little bit. And every one of those lives you saved is precious. And so great work and thank you for being here. And I'm sure we will have some interesting questions for you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, uh, as the slides come up, I would like to introduce Dr. Denise Hayon. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Denise. She Absolutely. is the co- Okay. She is the co-acting assistant commissioner and senior director of research and surveillance at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Use Prevention, Care and Treatment. She is also an adjunct clinical professor at New York NYU's College of Global Public Health 
in the Department of Epidemiology. She received her master's and doctoral degrees from Columbia and has more than 25 years of experience in the fields of public health, harm reduction, and substance use research. Dr. Payone is currently leading citywide substance use and overdose use surveillance as well as conducting drug-related morbidity and mortality studies with an emphasis on overdose deaths and the fentanyl-driven opioid epidemic. She co-leads the Real-Time Drug Surveillance Project Treatment STAT and Innovative or Prescription STAT, an innovative collaboration between public health and public safety that serves as a national model for jurisdictions struggling with high rates of drug overdose. Dr. Payone is a distinguished scholar at the CUNY School of Public Health and the former chair of the National Council of, of State and Territorial Epidemiologists Overdose Subcommittee. She has published numerous research papers and peer-reviewed articles. We're honored to have you here. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you really for inviting um, the health department to speak a little bit about um, what we've been doing um, and some of our responses um, during COVID-19. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so you've already heard a lot about um, the challenges and the concerns and what we focus, have been focusing on in the effects of COVID-19 um, on people who use drugs. Um, and so two of the areas that we um, have uh, really been addressing um, is the increased risk of overdose during this period. And unfortunately, um, we do not have um, our mortality data. Generally, by this time, we would have been able to release the first two quarters um, of 2020. But as I'm sure most of you know, the medical examiner's office was incredibly slammed during the surge in New York and are still digging out. Um, so while we hear um, in the media and often from police reports that overdose um, deaths are going up, we actually haven't been able to quantify that um, with mortality data. But I can say that our syndromic surveillance which has historically been predictive of mortality, we have seen um, some increases in um, particular uh, neighborhoods, those that have had sustained high rates of overdose um, mortality. Um, so to that end, of course, like one of the issues that we're focused on during this period um, is low tolerance associated with shifts in the dr uh, drug market and changes in behavior. Um, so we issued a guidance um, to address low tolerance, but part of the challenge now of getting uh, work out there is because we are not out there physically in, you know, in person. And so there, is all, there are also challenges around our messaging. <clears throat> and also the um, social distancing measures um, that we advocate and are needed to address um, COVID prevention. Um, or in opposition to our general messaging around overdose risk reduction. Um, and one area, and this is really what I'm gonna talk about briefly, is the prevention of the disruption of methadone and buprenorphine treatment um, during this epidemic. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, we have uh, published several guidance on safer substance use, harm reduction, and accessing the lock zone. Um, which we've had to innovate because we couldn't do our in-person training. So we're doing a lot of mailing of naloxone and we also implemented a naloxone pharmacy pilot where we gave pharmacies naloxone um, and now people could go there and just get naloxone for free. Um, and we also uh, issued a guidance on safer drug and alcohol use while in isolation or in quarantine. And as I mentioned, our um, guidance on on uh, low tolerance, which we will be reissuing when we release some data, um, hopefully in mid-October. Next slide, please. Um, but what I do wanna just spend a minute on is what I mentioned on the continuation of medications for opioid use disorder, MOUD, during COVID-19. So the health department um, heavily promoted Health and Hospitals Bellevue Virtual Buprenorphine Clinic but what we're um, particularly proud of is that in collaboration 
with OASIS and COMPA, we um, designed and implemented a methadone uh, delivery system. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, because we are, there was some relaxation of the federal regulations on March 16, um, the DEA permits doorstep delivery of methadone to people in quarantine or isolation. Um, so that's at home or in an isolation hotel. While SAMHSA permits and encourages um, OTPs to provide medication under blanket exception, so up to 28 doses for clinically stable patients and up to 14 uh, doses of clinically less stable patients. Next slide, please. Um, so we developed um, this system with two primary goals. Um, one was to prevent methadone treatment disruption, which of course um, could cause withdrawal, thus increasing risk for overdose, and to provide a means for people to stay in isolation or quarantine um, in order to reduce risk. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the eligibility criteria that we um, put in place, of course, at the discretion of the medical director for many of the OTPs, um, also for anyone who is COVID positive or experiencing COVID-like symptoms or um, age 50 and older, and have um, underlying comorbidities, which among the population is really almost about 80% of the population. So our focus initially really was on, um, on prevention. Next slide, please. So how does it work? Um, so the uh, medical director identifies an eligible patient um, and they make the referral to the health department so we, re we receive the name of the patient, and then we have staff, um, about 10 teams that are comprised of a courier and a driver. Um, and then they are then dispatched to um, a guest OTP who's been authorized to um, provide the doses for the patient. So our team goes to that um, OTP, um, picks up the medication or medication for several people, um, um, and they, the medication is in a lockbox. And we were pleased to announce that we had Oasis agree to put a naloxone kit in each of the um, lockboxes. So that was a success. Um, and we started on April 20th and we've um, made over uh, 16, actually 1600 um, deliveries since then. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that actually is my last slide. <laughs> Thank you so much. A lot of innovations coming forward. I'd, I'd love to hear more about the doorstep delivery. I'd like to um, welcome our last speaker and then we will open up to Q&A. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Sally Hodder, who is a professor of medicine and the Associate Vice President for Clinical and Translational Research at West Virginia University and Director and Principal Investigator of the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute. She's a graduate of Case Western Reserve School of Medicine in Ohio, I believe, and has been at the front lines of the HIV epidemic since she was an intern at the University of California, San Francisco in the 1980s. After completing an infectious disease fellowship training, she saw firsthand the emergence of AIDS in Africa while working on a schistosomiasis project in Coast Province of Kenya. Subsequently, she has had extensive experience leading large scientific programs. From 2003 to 2005, she served as Vice President of Virology Medical Affairs at Bristol Myers Squibbs. In 2005, Dr. Hodder was recruited to New Jersey Medical School in New Jersey to build an HIV program where HIV prevalence was nearly 3% among the African-American community. She has served as medical director for a large HIV clinic in Newark, which received us funding for both treatment and prevention trials. She has served as protocol chair for the NIH-funded HPTN064 trial 
a study of HIV incidence and risk behavior amongst, among over 2,000 United States women. In 2014, West Virginia Re University recruited Dr. Hodder to direct and serve as principal investigator of the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute funded by the NIH. During her tenure, the West Virginia Practice-Based Research Network was developed, which now includes 107 primary care sites across West Virginia. The Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, or ECHO, to enhance rural primary care providers' knowledge was implemented, and this is a telemedicine or a telementoring type of program, and opioid use disorder and resultant emergency epidemics were made a pragmatic focus. And by emergent epidemics, we mean hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. She again finds herself on the front lines as HIV outbreaks are emerging once again in West Virginia. Welcome, Sally, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. Could I have the first slide? I would like to really start by acknowledging uh, three people who really do the work and whose some of their uh, hard work, the, the results of that I'm gonna present. Uh, Dr. James Berry, who is the chair of psychiatry uh, and is, has just been a force for um, substance use disorder treatment throughout West Virginia. Uh, Laura Lander, who is a medical social worker who is, has wonderful patient programs. And Dr. Erin Wynn Stanley, uh, whose research, some of which you'll see, she is an outstanding investigator and has really helped us to drive data-driven uh, evidence solutions uh, to the substance use disorder problem in West Virginia. So this is Notes from the Heartland. If I could have the next slide, please. I'm not gonna read this slide. Much of what is on here has been said. I, I just would call your attention. We, uh, the previous speakers talked about harm reduction. Uh, and at a recent meeting this, this past summer at one of the best clinics uh, for dissemination of pre-exposure prophylaxis, the Fenway Community Clinic in Boston, during the COVID epidemic, their prescriptions for new uh, PrEP uh, refills decreased 72% and more than twice that for uh, refills. Um, I'd like to really just though, before I go on, uh, perhaps really describe context and contrast West Virginia to urban settings. West Virginia, as you know, is a small state with 1.8 million people. It's very mountainous, it's unbelievable, but it takes hours and hours to get to somewhere which in New Jersey and New York, we'd be there in 30 minutes. Um, it is the, the environment here has been chilling for syringe exchange a syringe exchange serving 5,000 individuals was closed uh, in the not too distant uh, pass in Charleston, West Virginia, the capital. Subsequently, there has been a, an HIV outbreak there. You might not have read much about it, uh, but there has been. And there was a bill introduced into the state legislature this year to outlaw syringe exchange programs in West Virginia, a place where we've had the highest overdose death rate. So when we talk about then superimposing in this environment, the COVID epidemic, uh, it is really uh, been quite a stress. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, the substance use treatment program in West Virginia, um, a key part of it is located at West Virginia University at the Chestnut Ridge Center. It, it, as a uh, inpatient and outpatient facility, but the outpatient uh, population numbers about 4,000. You know, prior to COVID-19, uh, telepsychiatry services were not offered. There were telepsychiatry services to some of our rural clinics that had implemented medication for opioid use disorder programs. Uh, but other than that, there was not much uh, telepsychiatry. Uh, West Virginia's stay-at-home order went into effect March 24th. Actually, West Virginia did a good job. Our schools were closed here before those of New York City. And early on, the uh, epidemic was flattened. Unfortunately, that has not remained the case. Um, in the six weeks after the stay-at-home order, uh, you can see there, there were over 9,000 telepsychiatry visits. 42% uh, were phone-based. 36% uh, uh, video, 
and about 20% uh, video-based group therapy, which is, of course, a very important component. Interestingly, the no-show rate uh, was not significantly different than it had been a year earlier. And not shown on this slide, our hepatitis C uh, treatment clinic uh, went very quickly to, to uh, telemedicine. And our no-show rate for first visits for chronic hepatitis C treatment actually decreased. We had many, many more people uh, taking part in the uh, telemedicine visits. Next slide, please. Uh, this is from Dr. Wynn Stanley's uh, publication that is uh, in press. And this shows there's the, the uh, dashed line that really comes down early on, uh, which were inpatient visits. Uh, this shows uh, data from daily data from March through May. And you can see that uh, telemedicine visits were greatly increased uh, over this period of time. Uh, and, you know, I think it's really remarkable that that was done. You can see the uh, video phone is blue, video is the darker green, video group is the slightly lighter green, uh, and then you can see the no-shows above that. So I, I think this was really a remarkable response. If I could have the next slide. This just simplifies that, uh, that really shows virtual vis visits went way up and uh, in-person visits way down. Next. I, I think there are a couple of important uh, lessons learned, and that's that, you know, the uh, CRC is the Chestnut Ridge Center success was largely due to really coordinated efforts of, of many uh, areas that the change in regulations really allowed telehealth visits from patients' homes and inclusion of phone-based uh, services. I think in West Virginia, you know, the, the roads are not great, they're windy, they're steep, and in bad weather, it is very difficult. Many patients can spend hours going one way to an appointment. There is literally almost no public transportation. And, and I would suggest among sort of some of the downsides that we've talked about, I, I think that this is really illustrated that telepsychiatry visits may be very effective, and I think it make it a lot easier for people to be retained in care. There were challenges. Uh, you know, my chart utilization was not easy, getting the right equipment and getting technical assistance for staff and patients was problematic. Not only, uh, however, anecdotal evidence really suggests that really patients were extremely thankful to continue their care. Now, what has happened and has transpired, and that is, is my last slide, you know, I had uh, given the context earlier that, you know, many of the, some of the harm reduction programs had been closed. Obviously, when the COVID epidemic came, Many of those programs, the existing syringe exchange and harm reduction programs had to close. You know, I think one of the remarkable things that has happened in West Virginia is that the rural primary care clinics have really, over the last year, two years, really expanded medication for uh, OUD in their primary care clinics and are really uh, starting to take up the slack for harm reduction, those syringe exchange at those offices remains rudimentary. Uh, I think that that really was helpful uh, and those clinics, many of them also were doing telepsychiatry visits. I don't have their data, but I think that that really was, was one of the silver linings that, you know, the contact with individuals was, there was an attempt to maintain it. And I think I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sally. I appreciate it. And I remember very vividly when I was down with um, a colleague of yours in, in West Virginia and a couple came in and had traveled two hours to the harm reduction center and realizing that I could just get on the subway here and be in a harm reduction center in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It really it really hit home the disparity in access to care um, between different states, different counties, um, 
throughout the United States, people grapple with all different types of challenges in accessing care. And as, as you spoke uh, and showing what all of you, what is being done over the last um, few months, I'm reminded of a quote by Al Gore. And he says, you know, sometimes change feels like it will never happen. And then when it does start to happen, it sometimes happens or can happen faster than we ever thought possible. And I think some of the statistics I, sh I saw here presented by our speakers shows that in a time of crisis, things that we know as service providers can improve access to care that people have been trying and trying to get into effect suddenly happen um, when when there is no other option, when people cannot move and, and telehealth has emerged and other abilities to provide doorstop, doorstep delivery. And, and we know these things can happen. They're practical, they, they're common sense. And, and it's, it's important for us to know that, that they can happen and, and it shouldn't take a crisis to improve access to care. Okay, I'm going to um, bring in my colleague, Lauren Walker, who's been collecting um, many of the questions. And while she gets ready to put forward the questions, I have one here from um, Vincent Martello. And he says, during this COVID period, we have seen a huge spike in homelessness, particularly among those suffering from opioid use disorder. Just wondering other, if others have seen the same. I live just off of Times Square and definitely have seen this um, exponentially increase. Uh, and I would like to open up to all of the panelists to respond if you have seen uh, an increase in um, lack of housing, in loss of housing, and how this has impacted on people, uh, ability to seek treatment, to stay into treatment, to continue harm reduction when they are homeless. If you just want to give me a heads up if you'd like to speak. Okay, Sin? One of the things I've noticed is that people who might have been willing to go to a shelter prior to COVID are, are afraid to go. They were afraid to go before. They were afraid of the violence. They were afraid of getting their things stolen. But now they're also afraid of this virus. Um, one of the ways that we've been trying to help people with that is by giving them weekly prescriptions or uh, now that we're able to offer more services on site, even daily pickup of medication so that they don't have to worry that medication for treatment of hep C or for their suboxone gets stolen. Um, but I am seeing an increase in people who are obviously not housed securely. Sally, please go ahead. Thank you, Sin. Well, I was just going to say in, in rural areas, often increases in homelessness are not appreciated. Um, I, can, I can tell you in Morgantown, many of you know, there's the homeless folks that are sort of down by the river. Folks don't see them. You know, it's not like, you know, sort of on Broadway where there are people sort of on the sidewalk. And, and I think that's all to say that, you know, my concern with rural populations is the extent of need and homelessness in particularly in this epidemic in a state that is stretched for public resources, particularly public health resources, I suspect that it's increased and we don't have the data. And when you don't have the data, that is, I think, most problematic uh, because then it's easy to ignore. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I think having the data is so important because without that, it can be very hard to, to make a case. Uh, thank you for that. This is a question for Denise. Those who receive their methadone for 14 days, what happens after the 14 days? How do they get evaluated again, given the current COVID-19 restrictions? How are you dealing with that? Right, so um, what we learned this week um, from OASIS, that, so the, when I think about the whole issue now, it's like really like when the um, infection rate was extremely high in New York City, particularly in April and parts of May and where we are now. Like, so very, very different and different, different responses. Those that are receiving 14 days right now, um, 
it's mostly because people traveled to other places and the state requirement that they self-quarantine when they come back from uh, places that are on that list. So it's a precautionary measure. And then I should say that the opioid treatment programs, the OTPs, have different policies in place on how they do evaluation. Like some of them are doing telemedicine, some of them require to come in for a physical exam. So it, you know, it differs by clinic. Thank you. Here is another question uh, from Vasundara, harm reduction. Apologies, apologies, let me stop that. Susan, you are still on mute. Thank you, Lauren. What is needed for increased availability, particularly in a rural geography, with the recent closure of the West Virginia Syringe Exchange Program? So how can we increase availability of harm reduction programs? What is needed? What can be done? Well, I think there's a lot that can be done. Will it be done is another question. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, consistent with the, the um, uh, National Academy of Medicine report last winter, I think we have to wrap services around individuals with substance use disorder. And I think that that is even more important in rural areas because, you know, it, we talked about all the issues with trying to get anywhere. Uh, in my opinion, I think that there are a number of outstanding primary care clinics. I have never met such committed men and women that work in these, who have initiated treatment programs. They didn't know anything about treatment of opioid use disorder, but with ECHO programs and so forth, they have done a great job. And I would suggest that I think we, and they've, they've also for harm reduction really implemented hepatitis um, testing, you know, education. I think we need to go further with PrEP and perhaps with further syringe exchange. There are some rural areas that have it, but there are a lot that don't. I think that the, the specific question about the dashboard, to whom should that be disseminated, I would suggest, you know, it's, it's not our usual substance use or behavioral medicine places. I think it's primary care in rural areas. Great, thank you. And that was a question from our director, Wafal Sadr, in line, um, you know, how can we get this toolkit and this dashboard disseminated? You know, who can we get it in, who should we get it into the hands of and what is the best way to disseminate that because i do believe that something like the dashboard is very practical and 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 dry, helps to drive people to see what is necessary any thoughts on that how to get it out to the people who need it angie i don't i don't honestly know what the best way is to to get it out um, I, this is something that I think about just in terms of like, how do we get out naloxone? How do we get out, um, anti-stigma information? Um, how do we teach more people about harm reduction? And there's so many ways that you can do it. And I don't think that there's any one right one, but I think that there's so many particular communities that could be doing a lot more, um, that aren't nationwide. Um, for instance, pharmacists, um, I, had a lot of engagement with um, pharmacy students and pharmacists um, over my time as the director of overdose prevention. And I found that there were so very few of them that could educate you about how to intervene in an overdose with naloxone. Um, and since so many people are picking up prescriptions and getting um, opiates at their pharmacies, that seems like a, one place that we really need to target. I know that New York State has done a really great job of that. Uh, with ESAP pharmacies, but I think that could be expanded um, to other states and certainly services um, like expanded syringe access could really benefit places like West, West Virginia, where I don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon, but certainly it would really increase access for folks. Harm reduction doesn't need to happen in a center and, and in rural places it doesn't. It typically happens on vehicles that drive out to communities for fixed hours during a week. 
um, like some of the services that we offer ourselves. But I think that um, in terms of getting this toolkit out, um, I think that you should focus on, on groups like that uh, and try and see what you can do to get as far as you can. Thank you, thank you. And I wanna piggyback on something you said and Sally said. Sally, you talked about you know the people, the committed people, and I just want to give my appreciation to all of you once more because when Lauren, who's on this with me today, um, had the chance to go out to Colorado and speak to people working out in Denver and Boulder, the commitment was amazing. And it's often by people in, um, you know, in non-governmental organizations working from grant to grant and, and also within academia doing just amazing things despite a lot of barriers and hurdles put in their way and, and paperwork that they have to fill out. But um, it is the people that work in this space are incredibly committed, passionate people. And, and I just hope that that is taken up by the infrastructure and the health systems in our country to a level where we can really address um, the opioid crisis in mass and at scale, and that is really what is needed. Um, and Angie, thank you so much for your comments. We will definitely work to get this to various primary care associations, different associations of frontline health providers, um, anyone I think that is that is at those front lines that is able to drive action. Um, community leaders, traditional religious leaders. I think everyone has an important role uh, to play in that. I have another question here, uh, and this is for Sally. Please discuss why there is low uptake of PrEP in West Virginia, especially among people who inject drugs and what can be done about that? If you could respond to that question. Yeah. Um that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the, the recent and ongoing HIV outbreak in Cabell, um, Huntington, West Virginia, uh, they have a superb local health department there who has been offering PrEP. And the last time I spoke with Dr. Cook Kenny, uh, people accepting it were under 10%. So the answer I would give to your question, well, a lot of people don't know about it. That clearly isn't the issue there. One of the casualties of COVID, we actually did a qualitative project among women who inject drugs, which, you know, if you look at, at Cabell, only two women uh, there accepted PrEP, 42% of that outbreak are women. Uh, and, and I am so embarrassed to say we had been so busy with COVID, we were midway through, you know, sort of those, those uh, quantitative, qualitative interviews. But I would say that the themes that came out are, as was mentioned earlier, they're chaotic lifestyles. Persons who inject drugs are frequently homeless. They had no place to put their drugs. They were concerned about side effects. Uh, and they, they really, you know, sort of felt, uh, why should I be worried about HIV? I'm just kind of worried about either sort of getting mm -hmm. my next dose or trying to stay clean. So I think it's really the hierarchy and particularly with the poverty, you know, trying to get your next meal, just have a roof over your head. Taking that prep pill is pretty low, I think on, you know, would be at low on any of our sort of agendas. I, I do think some of the advances with prep, you know, the longer um, long acting, um, uh, formulations that are coming. I think that those may be a real game changer. Of course, I think the concern is what's going to happen, you know, if, if folks then uh, don't continue to get it in a consistent fashion, will we see emergence of resistance and so forth? Hopefully not. But I think those are some, some of the answers. And I think also the other thing is folks haven't gotten prepped because there's been such stigma. Um, you know, I mentioned some good clinics and they're great, but I think, you know, there's been a lot of stigma about persons who inject drugs. So, you know, why would you really sort of go and just have another reason to encounter the medical system? Um, and that, that really came out in the few um, uh, qualitative interviews that we were able to analyze before we got completely consumed with COVID. Thank you. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. That The hour went by very quickly. Um, I hope we can do this again. I think all that you've brought up about stigma and, and that hierarchy of needs of people. When you have chaos and you have so many things happening in your life, and though you desperately want to be healthy, 
it's only so much that you can address at one time. And, and so I'd love to be able to do this again. We've had a great turnout. We've had over a hundred people on the session and I really appreciate your time, the amazing work you do. Thank you, Izzy, for being a young person today. So I love it. Um, I'll, I'll end by saying I have a daughter who's 18, well, 19, she just turned 19, at, um, in college, and she called me the other day and saying, Mom, my friend was just prescribed opioids for a broken toe. And <laughs> she was beyond upset. And so it's, it's the young people that will change the narrative. And so I'm very happy to see you here. And it gets back to what Angie said about pharmacists educating people and telling them she goes, she just was so upset, like they should have told her what they were giving her and why it's so important to be careful. So um, it's wonderful to have this time with you. I want to say thank you again to to ICAP and our team who developed the toolkit, to those of you on the front line, uh, to the young people involved in this work, uh, and to Johnson & Johnson for helping bring, make it possible for us to take time to devote to this important subject. Thank you all. <laughs>